All right, Alan, thank you very much indeed uh, for inviting me to speak this morning. I haven't been a keynote speaker for a very long time. Um, and uh, I was asked to really come and share some thoughts about the journey that I've been on from the early 2000s um, when I first got involved in what wasn't even called the cloud in those days. Um, but I stand here as probably the only person in the room that can't write a single line of code. I have no idea how you guys do it, the logic and the passion you guys show. Um, and uh, <clears throat> it has been an extraordinary journey. Um, so I really felt that uh, a perspective on the past, I can certainly give you the present I can try, of what uh, certainly I'm up to, uh, and then possibly the future a little bit about where I think it's all going. But uh, I thought a subplot might be more entertaining, how not to build a unicorn, a beginner's guide. Because really and truly, um, I was uh, a guy who had um, written, had been working in the city. Uh, I was a trader in, uh, in the days of Margaret Thatcher in the late 80s. I was buying and selling US government securities for a living. It was a highly paid career, but it was a very short-term career. And um, in uh, October 1987, um, you may remember, some of you may remember, some of you won't actually look at that, uh, the great crash, uh, the great stock market crash. In fact, in those days, I was living in a grace and favor flat in Pont Street, quite by chance, um, uh, employed by an investment bank that no longer exists called Kidder Peabody, it was bought by Payne Weather. <clears throat> and my parents had come to stay. They were going to drive down to Europe the next morning and go on a driving holiday. <coughs> and uh, anyway, Mum came into my room because I'd overslept and said, Darling, <clears throat> I think I've fused the lights. Uh, the alarm clock hadn't worked. Anyway, long and short it was, we looked outside and all the trees in Sloan Street were sideways. Uh, the place was just devastated. So it was nothing to do with my mother leaving the whole light on. <clears throat> anyway, the district line was working and I went to work and I was one of the few traders that came in as now and then a lot of traders came in from outside London. And I had my best day ever. I made millions of dollars for the bank. But I realized how, how flaky this existence was. And so within a couple of years, um, I had, through an article in the Times, um, an article by Patience Woodcroft, who still writes now, I'm not sure she writes for Times or not, um, Sunday time she does actually, um, an article about this very successful and growing um, industrial service company called, um, called Pertec. You may have seen their vans around, but basically I went from being a, a city trader um, with a smart car outside a flat in Chelsea to uh, crawling around on the buses, Catford and uh, the East End, Dagenham, <laughs> fixing the steel pipes and the flexible pipes under these buses. It was a just-in-time type service imported from uh, Australia. And one of my great heroes was a guy called um, Forbes Petrie. He'd founded, invented and founded Protoprint. You may know what Protoprint was a business of its time. And really what was starting to happen in my career was I was starting to help other people build out their vision. And now when I start to look back, I hope I'm not quite at the end of it yet, that's really what I've spent my career doing is helping people who are far cleverer and probably often got a far clearer vision than I have build their businesses and turn them from great technologies or great ideas into reality with all the things that you need to do over and above just building the technology. <coughs> um, so um, Pertec was a, was a means to an end. I built, it's like having five branches of Domino's Pizza. I sold them off and I met another guy, my second sort of superhero that I helped was a guy called Nick Findlay. Nick, I met in fact uh, at a meeting similar to this, it was actually a hotel in North of Hyde Park. He was wearing a pink shirt, um, <clears throat> I remember vividly, and he had this idea that he copied from America, which was messages on hold, a humble, really, technology. <clears throat> what he did was um, he bought little black boxes, a digital announcer they were called, and he stuck them into the back of the wire, um, uh, into the back of a good old fashioned Panasonic. PBX or whatever it was, and we would then send them messages via tape, can you believe, tape down a doctor, digital flash memory, and, uh, and we would update those messages as often as the client wanted. The, the sharp part of the market was the car dealership market. So it was captive marketing. When you <coughs> rang a car dealer and you put on hold, essentially you listened to a message they wanted to play you. And it was actually, it was a good business. And the economics behind it, the nuclear fission, which I'll talk about later on, the nuclear fission was, we bought those digital analysis for $100, and 
and we sold them for a contract over two years for 3,000 quid. So we just wanted to do an awful lot, and we did. Uh, we had a whole fleet of yellow pages type sales guys out there in those days because Google hadn't really been invented. <clears throat> and um, so we built that business, and then Nick, we started getting into the world of contact centers, and I don't mean from a technology point of view, I mean we just started voicing for uh, contact centers. We had clients like Parcel Force, uh, some big uh, travel lodge. And one day Nick came into my office, we shared an office, and that's always been my sort of philosophy, the clever guy here and me over here, frankly, because I hear what they say and then go and sort of turn it into whatever I need to turn into. And uh, Nick said, um, Jonathan, we've done all this voice of Travel Lodge, but we haven't sent it to Travel Lodge. I said, well, where the hell have we sent it then? So we've sent it to BT. I said, that's interesting. Why not? Well, we do that. And this was one of the very early um, cloud-based contact centers. It wasn't even called a cloud-based contact center in those days. Um, a Travel Lodge essentially had some intelligent routing in the network. And so we were sending the messages there. And so I actually took a couple of months out from working with Nick, um, just, I was still working with him, but I went and ended up in Oslo. And there was a very clever uh, spin out from Norse Telecom called Consultate. It still exists, you would know them. They're a competitor still. I think they're called, uh, they were, forgive me, they were, they were called in Telecom, and I should know. I know they changed their name a couple of times. And we became very quickly their biggest reseller in the UK, but we weren't very happy being a reseller. Um, we found there all sorts of issues, but it doesn't matter now. Anyway, then my third superhero appears in my life. So I've gone from Forbes, who'd, um, who'd built Pronto Print and now Pertec. Um, we'd, uh, uh, and then Nick Findlay, who uh, was a brilliant musician. He was great in the recording studio, very technical. <clears throat> and then my third superhero in my life arrived, and that was, um, that was Richard Pickering. So Richard uh, was a BT engineer. He, was a, uh, he joined BT at 16. He'd risen up through the ranks fast. Uh, he uh, had been involved in their contact center business. And then when he went to San Francisco, he bumped into Genesis, the SYS, Genesis CTI company, when there were four people. And he loved what he saw so much that he left BT, did his, served his notice, <coughs> went, uh, and joined them in San Francisco. Genesis eventually, I think, sold to Alcatel for two and a half billion dollars. Um, it was absolutely transformational in its time. Um, and he was about to retire <coughs> with Lynn, his, his wife. And uh, in fact, what happened, as they were literally about to sign the contract on a condo on the California coast, Lynn tapped him on the shoulder and said, Darling, um, uh, mum's not very well. And uh, you know, we all know that, what, what that means. When the mother in law's not well, it's not a good, not a good moment. Um, so, anyway, next thing he knows, he's on the plane back uh, to Torquay, the English Riviera. And um, <clears throat> so he's now stuck with things to do. In fact, the stock market crash of 2000 uh, didn't do him any favours. Well, that's uh, not pertinent now. But Richard is an extraordinary man. I mean, he had this vision that you could take a CTI switch and you could stick it up in the cloud, and you could take all those pre-integrated applications that you need to drive a contact center and make them available at the click of a mouse. And that's what we set out to do. And as I said, this is long before, this is 2002. He, he set the company up in 2000. He and Ashley Unit, I must mention Ashley, CTO, he was the guy that turned it into code, uh, along with a very small team of people. And when I met them, they were turning over 20,000 pounds a month, they didn't, in truth, know whether they were losing or making money. They had a sales guy called Alex Simmons who lived on a long boat in Leicester. We didn't see very much of him. And, um, but what, what we had was we had Premier Business Audio, which was a far more structured organization. We were profitable. And, um, and we, we knew we had a good profitable business. We knew they had technology. So we merged those two companies together. Um, now, I've kind of got to the end game before, so I'll quickly just touch on that. So, in, this was 2002. In 2010, May 2010, we raised five million quid. We'd actually sold Premier Business Audio off by this point for a couple of million pounds, um, and um, uh, raised the business. I don't remember the exact valuation. I think post money was about 25 million quid. And then I sold out in 2012 after the second round of funding. It's fair to say the private equity guys and I had a slightly different view of the world, but that was just the way it was. It was uh, perfectly amicable. And then, as you know. This young man over here paid 350 million dollars for 
in 2018. I was standing with Mark Daly on the day when the news came through at one of your events overlooking the Globe uh, Theatre uh, in October 2018. I don't remember getting a free beer either. I? <laughs> well, I'd already sold my steak by then. So, um, but, um, <clears throat> so in terms of this dream of the unicorn, we. Richard always said, in our dark moments when we were worried about money, when we were worried about the technology, when the whole thing had fallen over, we had one day, I remember, when I went to see Parcel Force in Northern Keynes, I went to see Clive Serpent, uh, uh, chief procurement guy. Now, this is when it was getting heavy. He was Royal Mayor. And of course, Parcel Force were the, they, they were the skunk works. They could do whatever they liked. They were parcels. They weren't blessings. <laughs> wonderful lady called Emma Bailey, who'd been our sponsor internally. And we'd won it because we won it because we were selling on 0870 revenues in those days. So it was nil cost to them, they were thrilled. <coughs> and just, yeah. So, so our bit of luck was that they were, as I mentioned, we had Premier Business Audio, they were an audio club, we were just doing voicing for them. They were spending £2,000 a quarter with us for us to make a few messages in the studios. But they had a problem, because when you get one of these through the post to say they've been and can you ring to organise re-delivery in those days, you had a 2% chance, 2% chance of talking to the local centre, to your local parcel force centre. That was it. It was a nightmare. So, of course, what did we do? We said to Emma, we can put all your telephony up in the cloud, we'll turn your 53 branch parcel delivery network into a single call handling unit, and we will deliver it to the, in a call centre way, the next available agent. And so we transformed that customer experience from 2% to about 96%. And then they said, and it nearly broke us. It very nearly broke us, just so you know. The story could have been very different at any point in this journey. It nearly broke us because they then said, and we'd like you to take credit card payments. And in those days, it wasn't terribly common on the phone. Um, it was more and more common, of course. But now we're talking 2004, 5, somewhere around there. I guess that's still a client of yours now. <clears throat> um, and they said, uh, we want you to take uh, credit card payments. We said, oh, fine, that's really easy. And of course, Richard goes, yeah, that's really easy. So we can the code. And uh, then they said, well, oh, we want it to be PCI compliant. What's that? No one had heard about PCI compliant. But, uh, and we agreed among ourselves that there were, well, we didn't have to agree, there are several levels of PCI compliance. Level three would be fine. Absolutely fine. No problem. <laughs> that's all they'll need. Of course, it wasn't. So we thought, two, that'll be five. No, 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 that's not five at all. It's going to be level one compliance. So about a million quid later, we invested in becoming PCI compliance. And Alan Duckworth, who recently left the company, I think, after a long stint, he was project manager on this. And he got us through by hook or by crook. I wasn't involved in the detail. I'm just not clever enough. Um, <clears throat> but that was, that was our bit of luck. And so when we were building out this dream of the unicorn, and we were determined we were going to be billionaires. It was going to be so easy. And as I say, in those dark moments, Richard always said to me, look, I've done it twice before. It's not that difficult. And of course, it is incredibly difficult. But what I, what I quickly go back here, um, I think, I'm pretty sure, of course, I wasn't on the board at this stage. I don't know. But I'm pretty sure that between 2012 and 2000. And 18, they did a round and a round a billion dollars, I think. You might know better than me, you bought it a lot more cheaply than that. But uh, um, I'm pretty sure that we achieved our dream, if only viscerally, uh, uh, or whatever the word is, and, you know, without actually being involved. So, what did we do to keep this dream going? Because it's very real. You guys all know you run businesses, it's very real. Cash is very real. Plants are very real. Technology working is very real. There's very real challenges. And technology is probably. When you really look at it, it's probably 20, 30, 40% of the business. It's getting it out there, it's getting the message, it's getting the clients, it's delighting them. It's all those things you have to do to make it real. And that was kind of where my side of things came in. But we, we absolutely believed it was going to work. When Richard picked me up off the floor because we had an incident, I'll tell you about one of them. We had an AQA, an exam board in Manchester. They're probably some of us, I've got to be careful, I guess. It's not being live streamed. Um, but to AQA, and I've been to see this chap, um, Clive Serpent, who was a Royal Mail guy. And uh, he, he, uh, I've been in there for about two hours. We were renegotiating the contracts. He found out how much money we were making. We were making 50 grand a month out of 087 over it. So it was fantastic. But he didn't like that when he found out. So we had to renegotiate the contract. <laughs> Unfortunately, we renegotiated just in time before the Say No to 0870 campaign kicked in and would have destroyed our revenues completely. <laughs> so it was like, thank the Lord. <clears throat> anyway, but we absolutely believed it was going to work. 
Um, we completely ignore those moments of massive self-doubt in the middle of the night when you know you just think it's all coming to an end and you can't pay the wages. We completely ignored, and my now ex-wife is never going to see this, but even she didn't believe what I was doing. <laughs> it was a bit of a problem actually. But we ignored anyone who said that we were completely mad, because you have to ignore them, because they just don't get it. They just don't get that you can go and change the world. Um, we were lucky. We were very lucky with Pass the Force. We made more and more luck, because we were actually, we had a great culture, we had a great team of people, and that, of course, is absolutely key. Uh, we smiled down the phone of our customers. We went and saw them. And um, when I came out of this meeting with Clive Serkham, I had a good old-fashioned Nokia block in those days, very cool. And we had, uh, I had 27 missed calls. It had been on site. That's right. That is not normal. And this was August, and it was the day of the GCSE results. You can just put this all together now, AQA, exam board, GCSE results. And somebody, mentioning no names, had been in and put up some new software overnight. Uh, and then shut the door, and gone to bed, and got to sleep, and of course, this meant a system, I can't remember exactly what happened, but it, it got into a spiral. And so, AQA hadn't had a single call all day on GCSE days. So and those are sort of days when you want to take yourself to the top of the nearest building and just jump. But it's just so much easier than having to explain to these people. And I've never had such a kicking for the next sort of few months, but I did. I went to every customer and apologized. We didn't lose AQA. We didn't lose uh, Dollar, who were a big uh, uh, competitor to Wonga. A uh, wonderful man called Raj Singh, who put his faith in me and uh, Newport's Media uh, a couple of years before. We absolutely helped him transform his business, because you can imagine, in those days, payday loans were just booming. You know, you couldn't get enough people to take the calls and borrow money, simple as that. Um, and uh, and, we, uh, and we, we, kept, we just kept um, looking at Far Horizon. But we did a lot of things wrong as well. We did a lot of things wrong. Probably. We got more things wrong than we got right, but then you know, if you don't bump into walls, if you don't make mistakes, then you're not going to learn. But the first of them was <clears throat> where Richard and Ashley, just before I met them, um, they'd set up an 0871 conferencing service, and this was bringing in about twenty thousand pounds a month, which just about covered their overhead, probably not quite. It was the only thing keeping them alive. And what we did about it, we were so busy building the CTI switch. We were very happy with our £20,000. We didn't realise the power now we're going to come into the market and build an incredibly easy, profitable business. So, and that was ultimately my fault. It was as chief executive, he would say, well, Jonathan, you're mad, you should have spotted it. But we weren't sure. We were too busy doing what we were doing. It was just nice having that £20,000 a month. We didn't realise it, but very easy, it several million pounds a month. <coughs> our marketing was poor. It was very difficult trying to get people to understand the cloud. They were still married to their customer premise equipment. How do you get that message across? Richard and I, we used to talk long into the night often. We said, 2007 is going to be the year of the cloud. 2007, it's going to be the year. Everyone's going to understand about this. So obvious. It's the only way you could possibly want to do business. Um, but even now, in 2019, I went to a trade show, legal show the other day, legal tech show the other day. They were talking about it. They just invented the cloud. <laughs> hey, guys, come on. Um, and our sales execution was very poor. Now we were, when, when you look at some of the hard-nosed sales models, you know, the, the, the really, and I learned a lot from them, and I'm a lot better at it now, but those hard-nosed metrics that we needed to drive, we were, we were, were not good. But we were in a market where we were, quite un, we were confident of ourselves, but we were unsure whether anybody would want. So we were signing up a lot of people, a lot of companies just desperately trying to save money. So that was one of the real sort of things we looked for. Now, what does your balance sheet look like? What's your PL? Because if you, if you don't want to go and buy expensive hardware, then this is going to cost you a few hundred quid a month. Does that work? A lot of our customers. And then, of course, we had the double issue. <coughs> First of all, the people like Raj, Raj Singh, he said, he said, I don't want anyone to know about you because you're my competitive advantage. I'm like, what the f <laughs> I want you to tell everyone. So getting case studies and testimonials was quite hard. And it was certainly very hard for people like um, AQA. They weren't exactly top of our list from case study. But what we did have, um, because of Richard's vision and the technology we were building, we had a fantastic board of people. And the two, apart from Richard Nashley um, and uh, Nick, before he sold out in 2007, actually, 
Um, but we had uh, a chap called Ian Fulton, who I met networking, and he'd been CFO of Skype. Uh, he'd, he'd contacted the founders of Skype, um, he's no one I have time to get, but, um, uh, and said, you need a, a CFO, and he got the job. And he was given 1% of Skype, and about two years later, it sold. <laughs> and so I met Ian. So he seemed like a good idea as a CFO. He came and joined us. <clears throat> and then um, the founder of Salesforce in Amir was a guy called Fergus Glossner, who may, I don't think he's involved anymore, but he was certainly very helpful uh, on the board with us. So basically the story of Fergus, he'd been, I think, with SAP, and he'd heard about Salesforce when they were a million dollar company. And he got on the plane with two of his mates, he's a, an Irishman, sports monster, a rugby football club, and um, passionate about it. And the three of them got on a plane, saw Mark Benioff and said, we want to buy the rights for Salesforce in Nero. You know, Mark Benioff said, not on your life, not on your life. But he said, here's a million bucks or whatever the amount of money was, and here's some equity. I have no detail on that, nor would I share it. But, um, um, <clears throat> and they founded <coughs> Salesforce in Nero. So having Ian and Fultonar, Ian and Fergus on our board was fantastic. But when I look back, one of the things we really got wrong was when we built the plan, Ian looked at our plan, which was going to go from, we were doing sort of 4 million a year, we were actually profitable, we were making about <coughs> four million, half a million of EBITDA by then. So we got ourselves into a great place, but we knew we needed the rocket fuel to grow the business. And um, when you show a plan like that to someone like Ian, who's seen these meteoric type numbers, we were going to be doing 20 million within about two years, I think, and it didn't quite pan out like that. In the first thing. So that was another massive mistake that we made. Um, but for all the right reasons. So now um, that, that, that journey ended, but um, it, was a, it was a brilliant decade. It was so exciting being at the front edge of the cloud, of getting people to start to understand what we were doing. <clears throat> and I'd always wanted to be chief exec and then chair of a business like that, and I achieved that dream, which was fantastic. So the conferencing business I took with me, the business we transformed it now into a modern sort of uh, compliant, and we think of ourselves as a compliant Zoom, we very much sell it to the regulated industries, um, we'll be launching a freemium model soon, of course we seem to have to these days, <coughs> but it's a big, big market. I was very lucky again to meet my fourth lot of superheroes, um, uh, Simon Millard and Mark Fawcett, these guys are uh, astrophysicists by training, <coughs> they um, uh, They've built their own telephony operating system. They work for Aculab, you may remember the DSPs. Um, and they used to have, the, we used to use their hard DSPs, the cards in our computers. And we used to use hosting from companies like us. Obviously, we moved to Amazon um, as soon as we could and actually manage that migration. <coughs> um, and so we built our own baby Twilio, I suppose, telephony operating system that sits at the heart of everything else that we do. So one of the Clients we have is Addison Lee. If you get into an Addison Lee minicab and you get a phone call, that's our telephony running that. We make about half a million calls a year for Addison Lee. Um, <coughs> SpeakServe, I've talked about, is a compliant Zoom essentially. Uh, we haven't got the private equity route, we're still privately held. It's a, it's a profitable business and we're growing it more steadily, perhaps, and not pretending that we're going to uh, be 20 million by tomorrow because it doesn't generally happen like that. Um, but it's nice to be there. And then my is it my fifth superhero? Maybe my sixth. Fifth, I think, is a guy who uh, I think some of you know, um, and that's a brilliant guy. Dean, are you Dean Bubbly? I am. Oh, I thought you might be. Okay, fine. I heard Dean coming in. But well, you know James Bodie. Very much. Um, so James, I got to know <coughs> over the years. Actually, I, I, I'm a great believer, as, as I think we all are, in you know, communication, getting to know people. And when I was running New Voice Media, we used to sponsor quite a lot of racing at, uh, at Newbury Racecourse. We used to take the old phone phone box, we thought that was a good idea. <laughs> and what we filled it with 100 people one year, which was great. Um, but you know, James is very good at turning up for those sorts of things. And, uh, and then one day he said, uh, actually Jonathan, I need some money. And uh, so he, he told me roughly what he did, and, and he's founded this company called Teller Research. You may have read about it, but essentially Teller Research has built a technology called multi-operated neutral hosts. And what that does, broadly speaking, Dean, you might have to take over from me here, but uh, broadly speaking is we make not spots profitable for MNOs. And the way we do that is deploy small cell networks 
uh, mobile phone networks and allow multiple operators to leverage that infrastructure so that the local people of the Chalk Valley or the Black Mountains or even sometimes the 32nd floor of your office in Canary Wharf can get a mobile phone signal. And excitingly, as you will have read, and no doubt loved reading as much as I did, but Ofcom changed the rules. Dean, you know all about this. And uh, the MNOs now have to give their spectrum up to, uh, to if it's a user or loser type basis. So who knows what's going to happen. It's an exciting part of the journey. And there's a lot of interest in what we're doing there. I'm not a, I'm the chairman, I'm not um, chief exec, James is the chief exec. So, um, this is kind of, if there's any one book that I read again and again and again, it's Jim Collins' Good to Great. You'll all have read it, I'm sure. If you haven't, then it's the best four or five hours of your life. But it basically talks about the core things you need to do to take the nuclear fission, the nuclear, that core idea, that thesis that you've developed, whatever technology it is that you're passionate about, and how do you turn that into a great business? And um, you've got to make sure your economic model is right. When you look at you know, the economic model that we work in, you just think, what on earth are these guys doing? And it's madness, absolute madness. Um, it's simply unsustainable. You look at the economic model of Zoom, which is what we're trying to do, if you think that looks far better, that looks fantastic, it's a profitable model. Every time you win a new business, you make more money, not the other way around. <clears throat> um, how do you scale it? But ultimately, as with all these things, it comes down to, uh, to people, getting the right people on board. We have a concept at uh, speed serve of the bus. We make sure we get the right, as hard as we can, to get the right people on the bus. The energy in the office is incredible. Um, and if they're not right, then we politely say there are a lot of other buses out there. So we're not embarrassed about it. We just say, look, a lot of you make sure they catch the next bus. We do as best we can. <clears throat> so, I mean, I'm not prescient. I mean, I've been very lucky in that most of the bets that I've played, made have worked out one way or the other. Um, the market is still incredibly young. Incredibly young. It's young in terms of the internet. And if you think of the internet as being 25 years old, 20 years old, the boom of 2000, it's still incredibly young. In terms of CPAS and SAS, telephony and telecoms, you know, there's a massive migration going on. It's like the gold, there's gold in the hills, Richard used to say to me. It's the <coughs> very early stages, so don't ever think that the market's mature or whatever. Yeah, it's changing, but there's a massive shift going from legacy to, to cloud even now all these years later. It's amazing how long it takes. Um, and um, what, what drives people's decision making, you're never quite sure, but you know, the momentum is there. And uh, it's a bit, I was, I was reminded when I was putting my notes together over the weekend and yesterday about that uh, wonderful Chinese guy who was asked about the impact of the Chinese, uh, of the French Revolution. He was asked in about 1970, do you remember this? He was asked in, the, uh, in, in 1974 the effects of the uh, French Revolution, he said, it's still too early to say, nearly 200 years later. Now, the tragedy about that quote, of course, is he was actually talking about the student revolution, which had been a couple of years before. But I uh, mean it sincerely that, you know, the, guy, the market you guys are in is just so exciting even now, and I've been dancing around it for about 20 years. And I came from a background, as I say, where I can't write a line of code, but you just want to, want to keep going, I hope I can. <laughs> so and I hope that's a useful insight into the journey, and I'm sure the guy here from college will We'll take it all back so, as to how, how they came to buy that business. But I hope you're happy with it. That was excellent. Thank you, John.